Good morning, everyone. So <clears throat> this week from Rays of the One Light, the theme is How Devotees Rise. It's week 24. So how many weeks are there, 52? Not quite midway through the year, are we? Almost. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Last week, we asked the question, why do devotees fall? And we considered the downfall of Judas in this context. Jesus, in answer to Judas's criticism for allowing Mary to rub his feet with spikenard, a very costly ointment, said, the poor always have ye have with you, but, ye, but me ye have not always. Jesus is saying here that there is one supreme injustice that needs eradication. Poverty, yes, but not of a material kind. Poverty in a spiritual sense. What happened was in this passage, since not everyone was raised with the Bible, is uh, Christ is with his um, devotees and they are sitting at his feet and one devotee pulls out some something to give a good foot massage with and it was a costly ointment and so this devotee was massaging Jesus's feet and uh, one of the critical devotees the one that ends up betraying him criticizes the devotee for using expensive oils on Jesus's feet and Jesus says, you know, you have me uh, for only a short amount of time. Uh, you have all these other things you could spend the money on after I'm gone, basically. And the, the whole purpose is to appreciate the guru when you have him, either physically in the body or even not physically in the body. And Yoganandaji said when we uh, meditate and we feel that bliss coming that we s hold on to that bliss we don't just say oh 20 minutes is over an hour is over I now end my meditation instead if we have the guru with us we should appreciate it and stay with it divine blessings are not common in this world they are extraordinary when they come, we should give them priority above every other consideration. Never allow a moment of inner joy, for instance, to be set aside for lesser duties. Divine attunement is our highest priority. As Lahiri Mahashaya, the guru of Yogananda's guru said, to listen to the heart's inner sound, Om, which issues from the very center of our being, is man's highest duty. Mary, on this occasion, was not communing in inner silence with Christ's spirit, as she had been when Mar Martha urged Jesus to reproach her for not helping out in the kitchen. That's another story we talk about. <laughs> Mary, this time, was serving outwardly, but in a very different spirit from the restless fussing for which Jesus had reprimanded her sister Martha. Those who see a radical difference between the paths of action and meditation should understand this distinction. To serve in the right spirit is necessary, for only thereby can we overcome our karmic tendencies toward restless activity. The important thing is that spirit be always inwardly focused, that in everything we do, we act in loving service to the Lord. Therefore, the Bhagavad Gita says in the third chapter, the state of freedom from action, that is, of eternal rest in the spirit, cannot be achieved without action. No one by mere renunciation and outward non-involvement can attain perfection. Whenever the spirit of God descends upon you, however, remember the words of Christ, me ye have not always with you. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. 
this we considered actually two weeks ago how devotees fall or why devotees fall and um, then last week we had a kirtan and sort of chanting and so we didn't read how devotees rise so uh, we were going to theoretically skip it but i thought it's better not to do how why devotees fall and then leave it with a thud and not also talk about how devotees rise just because it was out of order so um we had talked about this story of uh, Christ's disciple Judas and his criticism. And it was talked about at length in that other reading, but again, Swamiji brings it out in this reading that he criticized. And what did he criticize? He criticized the devotion of the other disciple, Mary. And that at least that's what she was engaged in doing. So you see, Mary was often getting it from all sides. On the one hand, she was, I mean, she was very devotional, and so her sister says, why are you just sitting like that at his feet? Come and help me with the idlis, and so on. <laughs> and Jesus was saying, she, ha she is choosing the better part. That's where those were his words. And he said, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that. What Jesus was saying was that that she was sitting, it was you could be sitting at the Guru's feet also next to Mary. One could imagine another disciple going, I'm very devotional too because I don't feel like going into the hot kitchen either. So, oh, Master, save me from the hot kitchen. And it wasn't that at all. It was the attitude with which, we, which she was doing it. In fact, Swamiji pointed out that maybe Jesus even said to Mary later, why don't you go help Martha just for her sake? We don't know that he didn't. So he might have. It wasn't the outer action. It was the inner attitude that mattered, that differentiated between those two devotees in that moment and again in this one, that she, Mary, now was being very devotional towards Jesus himself directly. And um, then Judas said, why is she acting like this, wasting this costly ointment as Darmini read? And why wasn't it sold and given to the poor, choosing perhaps a higher uh, purpose, maybe of service? And even that in itself isn't so isn't wrong and un obviously I mean he's saying and you can understand this debate sometimes comes up in religion that why should so much money be spent in a devotional direction why not instead help the people and sometimes that can be right it depends on the attitude you see if someone is saying I would love to make this wonderful murti and inscribe my name at the bottom of it donated by then that might be a problem you see, that's g saying acting devotional, but with a perhaps wrong motive. But in this case, um, Judas said what on the surface of it doesn't necessarily seem wrong, but Jesus said, leave her alone. The full thing he said was, against the day of my burial has she kept this. That he was, it, that was a big hint that not, that probably people didn't get at that time. But she, he was saying this was a precious moment because it was the last moment that he knew, but the others didn't know. And she somehow was tuning in. And so that this, what they all would have felt, what if, what if great gurus would do that and announce, by the way, I'm leaving the body in a week. I mean, just imagine all the big, you know, everybody would cry, they would come, they would have a big celebration, they, people who would, uh, who could would drop everything just to be with them because they knew this would be the last chance but it doesn't often happen that way we have to be able to tune in inwardly and then maybe these things do happen we hear the story of uh, Sri Yukteswar's passing and he appeared to Master and Master was away and a master was actually often away at the passing of all of his loved ones. He said, because God didn't want to have to fight with me for their lives. And also to spare me that pain, is the way he puts it in Autobiography of a Yogi. Sri Yukteswar appeared to him, and master said, is it over? And Sri Yukteswar just nodded. And so, but he, he was tuned into that 
uh, that his guru was leaving. Lahiri Mahashaya was said, you know, got some, one of his disciples, Swami Pranabhananda, I think it was, got the message, guru is passing, but he was delayed and couldn't come. And then Lahiri Mahashaya came to him and said, why do you go to Benares anymore? I am not there. And so again, he cried, because that loss, even for the saints, that physical togetherness is precious. And it can seem that when that is taken away, that then the relationship, the connection is taken away. It's not so. So how do we know this? Well, partly because the masters have said so. Yoganandaji said, when somebody dies, it's so sad because he said so much secrecy is observed that you don't get to see the other person. You think everything is over. But if someone is gone in Europe, then you don't think it's very sad. You might not be able to see them, but you know that person is in Europe, so it's no big deal. And so he said for himself that I miss people when they leave because it's harder to get to them. Harder, not impossible. He said, but anybody I want to, I can just call them and bring them back in a second. Quite an interesting thought. Makes you wonder if some of us he called and said, your turn, go now. And so the, this sense of separation is, is, again, one of the, he said he fought with God over this great unfairness of life. He said, because I know that it's all just a motion picture. I know nothing is lost, but they don't know. And so he said, God, God tells me the answer, that I'm bringing them all back to me. But he said, I don't like the answer. But it is the answer. God is bringing us all back to him. And we start to feel that on deeper and deeper levels. One other proof we have that the separation is not final in death is sort of indirect. But Yoganandaji said if you feel a close friendship with someone where you have an easy harmony between the two of you, it is only because, only because, you have developed that over many lifetimes together. He said it's the only way you can have an easy trust with someone. It has to have been forged lifetime after lifetime. So we may not remember those lifetimes. I remember in Atlantis when I was selling flowers. and No, it's not necessarily so specific. But more that you have that connection and why should you have it? Of course, we sometimes notice the opposite <laughs> when there is a disconnection and think, okay, well, it may be because of something wrong in the past life. That's true, too. Master said that of two disciples. They were, they were his disciples. They wanted to be positive and friendly, but they suddenly felt this great antipathy, this great hatred for each other. And Master said, you were enemies in a past life. And he said, but, you know, you, you've, br you've been brought here together to work that out. And so, and they did. Swamiji said they both focused not on their sort of instinctive feeling of dislike, but on looking at the relationship in the present. And you can say, well, I'll be sure to remember if I run into any past life enemies. But you know, it can be helpful, n even if it isn't, we don't know all the past life details, it may be somebody we meet. And we may have this difficulty with them, either because of something from the past, or because they remind us in their behavior of somebody else who uh, hurt us in the past, or just because it's just a disconnect, as I said. But we should try to bring it into the present and say, what happened today that deserves my, you know, frustration? You know, the person said, would you like some tea? How can you ask me if I would like tea? You know I prefer coffee. You offered everyone else coffee. It's typical that you would offer me tea. You see, there's <laughs> centuries of hurt and anger behind that. <laughs> that. And, but today it was only tea. And so sometimes we have to see if it's on our side to update those memories and say, in the moment or in this present, I have nothing really to, uh, to bring out my pistol for. But on the other hand, what if there are? What if it is a difficult situation? It's helpful if we can take space. Either physical space, that's the best kind. If not physical space, then emotional space to just breathe 
and not to be so engaged, so focused on the person and every little thing and all this thing. You see? Because we're just drawing ourselves downward. This is again how devotees rise. What did, what did it say? It said divine blessings are uncommon in this world. They are not common. They are extraordinary. They are rare. We have a great divine blessing in our lives through this path, through these masters, through knowing that spiritual uh, growth is the right direction. It takes a long time to come to this realization in the journey of a soul, a very long time. One proof of that is that Yoganandaji said, remember, if you see somebody making some mistake, going in some direction that you know will not bring them happiness, say, for example, uh, alcoholism or a chronic anger habit, and you think, he said, you know, don't you see what a mess you're making? Isn't it obvious it's not going to work out? He said, the only reason you can know that and feel no attraction is because you yourself have done it. So it's only through experience that we know that stealing cars is not a useful pastime. And first, because when you first start stealing cars, you get caught, and so that's a problem. But then you get good at it, and you start to steal the car, and you get away with it. But then you feel badly. Because then the police finally come and they take the car away. I mean, you were caught at the moment of trying to steal. Hey, what are you doing? Come with me to prison. <laughs> now, you get the car home and you get to drive it, but then, you know, they do various things to find you and then, then you go to prison. Then finally, you don't have to go to prison anymore. You're so good at stealing cars that you just have them. But then we're in a prison of our own guilt. If we finally grow a conscience, we start to feel badly that we took the other person's car, especially if you see them walking around with the keys going, <laughs> Enge. But the other side of it is that we start, the first step of that is that the thief is worried everyone is going to steal from him. You see? That's the thing, that we, he, because he sees that, that's how he sees the world, is that of taking, he thinks naturally, he thinks that everyone will see it the same way. This is why when we look for evil, Rem Yoganandaji said, remember, whenever you find something wrong in the world, it's wrong with you. Now that's a hard teaching sometimes, because we see all kinds of wrong things that are sort of abstractly wrong, and we say, well, is it wrong with me? But what he was, there, there is something to be spoken about, and maybe we'll get into that level of philosophy, but it's more the short-term thing, this is wrong, that person is wrong, why they talk like that, all these kinds of things. The, when we are criticizing, then there's no love there. That's actually the opposite of love, is criticism. It's interesting. You would think the opposite of love is hate. But on the spiritual path and in other places, they say when love is out of balance, it becomes criticism, it becomes critical. And so, when we're seeing something wrong with the other person, you know, it may be that we could sort of, it's not that you lose all discrimination and somebody's slapping you and you say, what a good slap, excellent, very good, try the other hand. <laughs> it, it isn't like that. But rather that we, we try to see God in that other person or we try to see God in coming to us through that other person. What are you trying to teach me? I remember once I was leaning over trying to get something and I got up quickly and banged my head so hard. I saw stars and I was checking for blood and all this and then I thought, Divine Mother, what is it you're trying to teach me? And the thought came back to become more aware of your surroundings. <laughs> 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 it wasn't really that deep, you know, just sort of like look around, be in your body, notice what's going on around you. And, <laughs> and so anyway, going back to this, that if we see people making a mistake, it is because we have done it. It takes a long time to do all those things, to be a pirate, to uh, first you work on stealing bicycles, as I said, then maybe you steal whole companies. You know, it's just, we can it, take it a long way to then realize, no, that didn't make me happy. So it, that's why I say it takes a long time to come to the point on our spiritual journey where we say, I actually want God. 
And that is what will make me happy. How do I know? Because I've tried everything else but God, and it hasn't worked. And so the, that's the sort of the, um, the due diligence, the market research. Every other product on the market is terrible in the end. Why? Because it just doesn't fulfill us for long. A little bit, maybe, at first, but then it loses it. It's only God that fulfills everything, and every fulfillment we seek can be found in God. And so I don't mean if you want friends, don't have friends, only seek God. Of course not. If you have good friends, see God enjoying that friendship through them, through, through them to you. Try to offer God's friendship through yourself to them. But isn't it wonderful what Swamiji's song says that we just sang? When I laugh, oh, and when I cry with pain. When? When what? What would make me laugh or cry with pain? When I lose the car because somebody stole it, or because I got really sick, or because I lost a lot of money. All the different outward things, he's, what does he say, is the reason that would cause me to cry with pain. He says in the song, when my best friends misunderstand. Isn't that, you know, poignant? The, the, the people we hope or feel would be on our side. They misunderstand. And then that's what causes us to cry with pain. Because not much else we are looking for in this world, but there should at least be that. And what's the solution, he says, In my heart, Lord, ever so silently, I will always think of thee. As Master said, God is the friend of all friends. He is the only one who won't ever misunderstand us. Swamiji said that about Master, being with Master. He said he was always on my side in every situation. And if Swamiji was opposed to another disciple, perhaps in some, you know, if there was some hurt feeling, say, it wasn't that Master was against the other. He was on everybody's side. That happened once. There was a discussion at Ananda where there were two people, for some reason they had gotten into a, an argument, and one of they were working together, but one wasn't a part of Ananda, but was for particularly somewhat unusual circumstances, was working for the department anyway, professionally. And uh, someone in the meeting said, well, you know, the other person is a devotee and deeply committed, and we really have to be on that person's side in this. And Jyotishji said, no, we are on everybody's side. You see? And it was understandable what the other person was saying. And he didn't even say, we will be on the side of truth. And we will find out through our private investigator who is telling the truth or not. And then it wasn't even that. It was, we are on everyone's side. Even if someone is making a mistake, even if they're wrong, all the more reason why they need our help or our prayers or our friendship, or our patience, or our understanding. And so, in this way, we find that God fulfills all these desires. And so, sometimes it seems like we are sacrificing these outer things in order to get this divine joy. Sometimes it feels like these things are being sacrificed for us <laughs> by God, <laughs> that things are being taken away so that we end up with nothing but God. Master met uh, one man who, uh, no, I think was it, I don't remember exactly how, who was it, whether it was Master or not, but the man said, I've lost my house, I've lost my job, my wife left me, I've become a renunciate, I've renounced the world. <laughs> and Master said, you haven't renounced the world, the world has renounced you. You know, it can't be done by default. But when these things get taken away from us, there's that beautiful line from the poem, The Hound of Heaven, that Master recorded. He didn't write it, but someone else wrote it, but he recorded it. And at the end, the uh, God says to the devotee, all those things that I took, uh, I took not for thy harms, but only that you would seek them in my arms. All that thy child's mistake fancies as lost, those things that you think have you've lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. So we find we haven't even lost anything, even the things we thought we lost for the sake of God. No, it's all there. But an even greater fulfillment 
And so this is how we rise, by recognizing that it's God alone that will fulfill us and directing our energies in that way. It's not an abstract thing. You know, I, 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 I don't have a good job. God alone will fulfill us. You know, work to get a better job. I don't, I don't sort of enjoy the company of my friends as well. God alone will fulfill us. Well, again, we get friendship by giving friendship. We receive loyalty by giving loyalty. That doesn't mean that if we give loyalty to that person, they may be loyal to us, but others will, if not that person. Interestingly, on the question of loyalty, Swamiji said, never assume loyalty in anyone. He didn't say assume disloyalty, but don't assume loyalty. You have to wait until you see that loyalty, that friendship tested. Only then can you start to have faith in the person's loyalty. And it isn't that they should be loyal, but we can make a mistake and even feel hurt when our best friends misunderstand, when they are disloyal, because we assumed a loyalty that wasn't there. Meanwhile, we should work on giving that loyalty. That which we want to receive, we should give, and then it naturally comes back to us. And even if it doesn't immediately, even in giving it is its own fulfillment. We feel that way. I don't mean give loyalty and you will feel fulfilled because the scriptures say you should feel fulfilled. No, we feel that. We feel a peace of mind in having done the right thing. And so, as it says, divine blessings, as Swamiji said in the reading, divine blessings are extraordinary. And that's what Jesus was emphasizing. This is a moment that you as my disciples, he was saying, are having with me and this moment will not come again. And so that's true, of course, that was true earlier in his life, too. And this can be one of the dangers of the devotee uh, on the spiritual path, dangers to the devotee, is that we can take these blessings for granted. We can take them lightly. When Swamiji left the body, some people were saying, I felt he would always be with us. I somehow logically knew that he wouldn't. But I, I just was completely surprised when he left. It was added to the fact that he had gotten an Augustia reading that said he would live to be 91 or 92. And which of course, I mean, which would actually have been this, this year. So we were thrilled when we got that news. But he kept kind of hinting that, I don't think that's right. And he was saying, I hope it's not right. And he was saying, look at my body at the rate it's going. I mean, he was having such difficulty. How is it going to go on for five more years? He said, the Augusta reading cursed me to live five more years and so on at one point. But the thing is, on, the other le on another level of truth, that man, who one of the men who said, he, I thought he would always be with us, was right. Because we do feel, if we tune in, that Swamiji is still with us, that Master is still with us. Master said, my guru is more with me now, after his passing, after Sri Yukteswar's passing, than he was when he was here on earth. Swamiji said he felt much closer to Master as the years went by. He was with Master for three and a half years. Out of his whole life, it was not a long number of years, but it was enough. <coughs> and he, that connection grew. These Masters, your Guru, looks after you. And he is much closer to you than perhaps we are to him when our minds are distracted. So this is why we should devote that attention as Mary was demonstrating outwardly, intuitively. It was good she did. If she had said, no, no, I'll do the foot massage next week, she would not have had the opportunity to. Master said that too near the end of his life. He was just about to go out for a walk on one of his last days, and then he sat down and said, no, I have to write this right now. And he began dictating a long lesson on this deep spiritual truths. And they were up until 2 a.m. He was supposed to take a walk like at 7 p.m. or something. And when he finished, he said, if it hadn't been done today, it would have never been done. And people, oh yes, well, they didn't realize he was days away from leaving his body. And so, but the, the Guru's consciousness continues and stays with us and our awareness of it grows stronger if we work at it. And so, let us appreciate 
the preciousness of God's presence in our lives. Let's try to increase that. There are a lot of other things we would also like. Thank you, God, for your divine presence. Also, it would be nice if someone could fix the plumbing problem, and it's really hot right now, and so, you know, we have a long list. But you see, this world will just go on. I was telling some of you this yesterday. This this world that we're in that seems so immediate and so important, full of uh, GST and all kinds of things, that seems so relevant, it's just the same show. Year after year, decade, century, millennia after millennia, and I mean millennia. Swamiji talked about these letters that he found, uh, that he heard of, um, that were reported in the news, ancient Egyptian letters. Let, you know, uh, a missive, a letter between a father and a son. Uh, in this case, rather, a son to a father. The son is away from home studying, and he writes to the fire, father. And what does he say in his ancient Egyptian text? He says, send more money. <laughs> and then the, there's another letter from one parent to a child and that they, they were able to decipher in the hieroglyphics or whatever it was, and it said, why don't you write more often? <laughs> Does it sound like anything you've ever heard before? <laughs> you see, thousands of years ago, we could all be going... <laughs> and it's the same old story. <laughs> when will you get married? Why, what about my fixed deposit? And so on. So how many thousands of years, how many thousands of marriages, births, deaths, fixed deposits do we want to amass? You see, it's the same story. This world goes on to a certain point, but never beyond. That's why God is here hiding, calling. So when you have that blessing, you can choose to Meditate, for example, or chant. When, when I say the blessing, meaning you feel that desire to commune with God, but also there's these other things. I'm not saying quit all, quit all your other duties, but they can so quickly become out of proportion. We all fight this struggle. Just about to meditate, but then there's an SMS, or the phone rings, and it's urgent and has to be dealt with. I dealt with that just recently, that we get pulled off. And if that does happen, say, Om Guru, fine. And then once it's dealt with, go back to the meditation. We can't always, you know, get it right the first time, but we can get it right the second time. And so, to feel that I'm going to give this life to God, I'm going to give this moment to God, and I'm going to give more and more of it to God, because it's the only thing that matters, it's the only thing that lasts, it's the only thing you take with you. And you really do take it with you. And all these other things just continue on in the same way. So Jesus said, the poor ye have always with you, which is another way of saying this world will go on like this, whether we are a part of it or not. It will always be the same. If we find God for ourselves, we can also then bring that to others. It's much easier to play in this world as a saint as someone who knows God, because you've graduated, so then you can help others to graduate. That's what the saints do. They're trying to help others to get off this merry-go-round, this wheel. And so we can do that too, not even just after we find God, but even on our way. We can share with others autobiography of a yogi, for example. We can talk to them if they're interested about how meditation has helped us and encourage them to learn it too. It's okay and, and good to share what you found, share the treasure with others. But even if they all reject it, even if they all accept it, still, God is our only destiny, our only fulfillment. And so remember those words as, as, it, as Swamiji concluded, that me ye have not always. So like for an opportunity to go on pilgrimage, it's easy to skip a pilgrimage. And yet sometimes it's the right time and then it's worth going. And don't try to talk yourself out of it. Try to talk yourself into it. Because you know what happens if we miss a pilgrimage? I'm just picking that as an example. What happens to us? Nothing. Nothing. We wake up the same way in the morning 
is the same old life. There's no loss, but there's not the gain that could happen. And it's not necessarily just because the pilgrimage site is so holy or only that, but because we are devoting these days to God. And the pilgrimage is in a way just an excuse to do that. Same thing with going on a retreat or something like that. It takes us out of our duties so we can focus on God unbrokenly. So um, I'm not advertising retreats or pilgrimages in this, but, I, but still, there are good examples in this case, and they've happened recently. But in any case, every day we can set aside a part of that time for pilgrimage, for retreat, to be alone with God. And... Um, let us let us all you know take a renewed vow and inspiration to do that to really offer ourselves more completely to god so that he enters into our lives and fills us completely with his divine presence i'd like to transition would you like to say something i'd like to transition to the um, we are dedicating the Sri Yukteswar Murti today, and it would, it, Sri Yukteswar Ji is, is scheduled to arrive uh, in just a moment. But um, I wanted to read first this invocation Master wrote dedicated to Sri Yukteswar. <laughs> thou light of my life, thou camest to spread wisdom's glow over the path of my soul. Centuries of darkness dissolved before the shafts of thy luminous help. As a naughty baby, I cried for my Divine Mother, and she came to me as my guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar. At that meeting, O my guru, a spark flew from thee, and the faggots of my God craving gathered through incarnations, smoldered and blazed into bliss. All my questions have been answered with thy flaming golden touch. Eternal, Ever-present satisfaction has come to me through thy glory. My Guru, thou, thou voice of God, I found thee in response to my soul cries. Slumbers of sorrow are gone, and I am awake in bliss. If all the gods are displeased, yet thou art pleased, I am safe in the fortress of thy pleasure. And if all the gods protect me behind the parapets of their blessings, yet I receive not thy benedictions, I am an orphan, left to pine spiritually in the ruins of thy displeasure. O Guru, thou didst bring me out of the bottomless pit of darkness into the paradise of peace. Our souls met after years of waiting. They trembled with an omnipresent thrill. We met here because we had met before. Together we will fly to his shores, where we will smash our planes of finitude forever and vanish into, the, into infinite life. I bow to thee as the spoken voice of silent God. I bow to thee as the divine door which leads to the temple of salvation. I bow to thee, to thy master, Lahiri Mahashaya, harbinger of yoga in Benares, and I lay the flowers of my devotion at the feet of Babaji, our supreme master.